presentation. I have spoke to um, have spoke to Great Neck North Middle School kids now for I think this is maybe the fifth year, and uh, but I've never done a virtual presentation. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, we're doing that right now. So um, I'm used to looking at the audience and um, getting feedback from that. I don't have that this time. And I usually do it with a PowerPoint, and I don't have a PowerPoint. But uh, today, we're going to talk about drug addiction. And um, I'm going to give you a few statistics. I know most of the statistics I've been looking at lately have to do with the uh, coronavirus. And those statistics don't really mean a lot to me. Like, if you were to tell me with, with the coronavirus that... Um, if you were to tell me that over 90,000 people have died, uh, that doesn't really have that much of an effect on me. If you were to tell me that one of my friends has, has passed or has gotten the uh, disease, that has an effect because it becomes personal. So when I tell you over 11 million people in this country right now are uh, drug abusers, opioid ab abusers. I don't know if that has an effect. If I tell you that uh, over 70,000 Americans die every year, over 70,000 die every year from, from opiate addiction. I don't know what effect that would have either. Or 130 a day, figure it that way. 130 people a day on an average die from, from opiate addiction. And it's the leading cause of death in, in, in young people. But that doesn't have much of an effect. So I need to make it personal. And to do that, to have an effect on you, I'm going to tell you a story of my son, Kevin, who, who died from an overdose. And... Um, let me make it as personal as I can right now. Because I don't have a PowerPoint, I'm taking pictures off the wall of my house. And, and I'm going to be showing you, like, this is the first picture. Let me see if I can get this to you there. Um, that's Kevin. This was a gift given to me after Kevin passed away. This is his senior picture in the middle. And all those little pictures on the outside of Kevin from first grade all the way up to 12th grade. It doesn't get more personal than this. This is my boy. And the reason that I've done so many presentations since Kevin's passed to colleges and to high schools and to middle schools and to community groups is because nobody knows how to stop this, this opioid epidemic. They can't come up with a vaccine like they're going to come up with for COVID-19. They have to, you have to educate people. And the best way we can do that, I think, is this a story that touches home. And um, so that's what I'm going to do. When Kevin passed, I, uh, I started writing a book. This is the book here. This book is called Forgiving Kevin. And it was my way of healing from his death. So I'm going to start the story using pictures. Um, when Kevin was 13, and I think that's how old most of you are. When Kevin was 13 years old, his, his mom and I split up. Uh, we lived in Merrick, and then Kevin and I moved with my mom to Lynbrook. And my son, Matt, stayed in Calhoun. He was a senior at Calhoun. And this is, uh, this is a picture of Kevin and Matt when Kevin was 13. Kevin's there, uh, the little guy, and Matt's his brother, older brother, and that's my mom in the middle. That's one of my favorite pictures there. But that's how old Kevin was at 13 years old right there. And when we moved to Lindbrook, well, Kevin always wanted to come to Lindbrook because I was a, uh, I was a teacher there for 36 years. And I taught social studies for all that time in high school. And I coached three sports. I coached football, wrestling, and lacrosse. 
And at one point or another, I coached all of them in middle school. So I know your age group pretty well. When Kevin moved, we were, when we, when we moved to Lindbrook, uh, Kevin was very excited because, well, from the time he was a little kid, he was on my sideline or in the wrestling room with all my teams. And uh, we were pretty good. So he was he was thrilled at, with the idea of coming to Lindbrook and, and playing on those teams that he's been watching since he was born, really. This was a big deal for him. At 13, he thought it was the most exciting thing that could ever happen to him. Come to Lindbrook High School, play for Lindbrook, play for his father, and, uh, and win a lot of games. And um, it worked out pretty well. Kevin was a – Kevin had a problem where he was labeled – learning disabled, which means only that he had trouble reading because the letters on the page look different to him than it does to normal people. So he had a learning disability. But look, his father was a teacher and his mom was a teacher. We we're both teachers. And um, he wanted, and, his, and we were both coaches. And he wanted to become a, a great student athlete. And so he worked at it. You know, he worked at, at his academics. He, because he was learning disabled, he got, he got resource room. He got special attention. He got extra time on tests. He got a lot of, a lot of benefits, but he had to work real hard. And he did. He wanted to be a great student athlete. And he was on the honor roll despite his learning disability. He was on the honor roll all the time. And as far as athletics goes, he was a great little athlete. You know, he was, he was, a, uh, he was the running back for the football team. He was a, a good wrestler. He stopped wrestling uh, after his sophomore year, though. And he was an outstanding lacrosse player. And we were an outstanding lacrosse team, you know. Um, My favorite picture is this one here, okay? This is Kevin and I uh, at the end of his senior year. You notice around his neck there, there's a gold medal. And that's, that means that we were New York State champions, not only in the senior year, but in his junior year as well. Kevin came to Lindbrook because he was excited about the sports. And the only two state championships of any sport in Lindbrook High School history was lacrosse in his junior and senior year. And Kevin was a great player. And so things couldn't have gone much better for Kevin at Lindbrook High School. He did well in his studies. He was a, a star athlete. He was a popular kid. He had tons of friends. Teachers loved him. Um, everything was good at Lindbrook High School when he went there. And um, he got a scholarship, a lacrosse scholarship to the University of Massachusetts. He had lots of offers. And we took the University of Massachusetts because the coach from UMass was a former player of mine. He went to Lindbrook High School. I was his coach, and he became, and is still, he still is the coach of, uh, of uh, UMass, one of the top teams in the country, really. And so Kevin had it all going for him. You know, in high school, he was like, you know, a prom king type of guy, and he was, uh, he was a great athlete, and he was going, got a scholarship, and everything was great. And when he went on to UMass, he played very well for UMass. But he picked up a terrible habit. He became an abuser of opiates. The uh, actual pill was called Oxycontin. Its uh, generic name is Oxycodone. And it's one of the most powerful drugs that there is. And it's one of the most addictive. And now, 
nobody really starts, I think, uh, with Oxycontin as a drug. Usually, when Kevin became addicted to Oxycontin, um, I, I found out the hard way. I couldn't, um, I couldn't pin down what was the matter with Kevin. His coach had called me and said there's a problem with him. He thought maybe it was drugs. Uh, Kevin was admitting to nothing. I, I put his brother Matt in charge of uh, trying to find out what's the matter with Kevin. And, and finally, it came back that Kevin was doing Oxycontin. He was doing OCs, they called it. And that's a powerful drug. So I didn't know anything about it. So I called, um, I called the uh, Long Island Council for Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. And I said, look, I have a son who's apparently addicted to, uh, to Oxycontin. And the man on the phone said, Mr. Glenn's, that's, that's what's happening now. That's the worst drug out there. It's the most addictive drug out there. And let me tell you something, Mr. Glenn's, nothing good can happen to your son while he's addicted to this drug. Doesn't matter if he goes to college, doesn't matter if he, he's an athlete, nothing good's gonna happen if he's addicted to this drug. So I said, okay, so what do I do? He said, well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to run an intervention for him. And he gave me, a, he, 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 he uh, recommended a, a book and a pamphlet where I could run an intervention. Now an intervention is this, I get all the family members and people who Kevin loves and respects to come to my house. And we don't let him know that we're on to the fact that he's addicted to Oxycontin. And he's coming over to my house um, because he was living with his mom at the time. He's coming over to my house thinking that he's coming to dinner. And it was around Christmas time. Matter of fact, it was Christmas time of his senior year. And he came over for dinner. And when he came, I already had his coach from UMass. His, uh, I was his coach in high school. So the assistant coaches that he had in high school, I had his mom, I had his brother, and I had some family members that he loves and respects. And when he came in the door, there was a big Christmas tree that was blocking the living room. So he says, hi, dad, how's it going? Everything's good. And as he turned the corner, he sees, he sees all these people, including his college coach. And he says, hey, what's going on here? What's going on here? And I said, Kevin, sit down. We know about your drug addiction. And we're all here because we love you. And we know that you're in trouble with this drug addiction. And we're all going to talk to you. And I asked him, please don't say a word, Kevin. Let everybody here speak. And then we'll get, let you have a chance to talk. So every one of these guys who he loves and respects, and his mother and his girlfriend was there, all of them told them how much they love him how much they respect him and how scared they are that he's become a drug addict on opiates, the most addictive of them all. And Kevin listened, and didn't say a word, but his eyes were burning a hole in me. They were full of anger. He couldn't believe I had, I had, pulled all these people together and that I had given him up as a drug addict. He was furious with me. And we said, after we were all done, we said, Kevin, look, tomorrow we have, we have set up something with a rehab. You're going to go to a rehab out on Long Island and it's a 30 day rehab. Now he was right between the first semester and the second semester of his senior year it was the winter break. It was Christmas time, and there were, he had 30 days. He had over 30 days, and we were setting this up so that he could go to the rehab, detox from the drug, get clean, learn how, learn how to stay clean, 
And then he could actually come back to UMass in his senior year. Now, remember, he's been a lacrosse player his whole life. He's one of the best guys on the team. And he could come back and, and play for, for UMass in his senior year. And he could go to meetings up in Massachusetts and, and uh, do all the things you need to to stay clean once you've been addicted to this drug. And he, after everybody spoke, he denied that he had a problem. He said he tried it, but, you know, he's not a drug addict. And we knew he was lying. But that's what drug addicts do. Drug addicts always lie. And if they get caught, then they just minimize the amount that they use. So that's what Kevin was doing. He was lying to everybody. He was minimizing how much he, how much drugs he did, where in fact he was doing Oxycontin every day. And Oxycontin isn't cheap. So where was he going to get the money? An Oxycontin pill that he was taking was about 80 bucks a day. Where was Kevin going to get the money? He wasn't rich. His parents were teachers. He, he wasn't a rich kid. Where was he going to get the money? And that's a, a, kind of a big question. You know, where, where was he going to get that? Where was he getting that money anyway? We will, uh, we will eventually find out where he was getting it. But at this intervention, although he denied it, I said, well, Kevin, listen, this is the deal. If you don't go to, if you don't go to rehab, for 30 days, you're not going back to school. And you only got really, you know, this is your senior year. You don't have much, you don't have much time left. This is your last lacrosse season playing in the big time, playing in division one of college lacrosse. And he slept on it that night. And the next day he said, okay, okay, let's go to rehab. And we took him the next day. He didn't want to go in. He was getting nervous the whole way there. I had his girlfriend with me in the car, Kevin and his girlfriend. And I was trying to keep him calm the whole time because he was getting nervous going. And when, when we finally got there, he said, hey, I'm, I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of here. And uh, finally, the, uh, the doctor says, come with me, Kevin. And he did go in. And he was, uh, he was a tough nut to crack. He called me. He must have called me a hundred times a day, cursing me out, saying I don't belong here. I'm not a drug addict. What do you What do you do to me? All this kind of stuff. And we knew he was a drug addict. We knew he was in deep trouble. But he denied. He denied. He denied. After a while, the uh, counselors at the drug rehab they got to him. He came, he came around. He came to realize that he was a drug addict and that his whole life was being threatened by this. And so after the time was up, Kevin came out clean, educated about it, and ready to go back to UMass. And he did. He went back to UMass. He had to tell his teammates that he's been in rehab, that he's a, been a drug addict that he's clean right now. And as he was taught in the rehab, you can't do any intoxicants. You can't drink beer. You can't drink anything. You can't drink alcohol. You can't smoke pot. You can't do any intoxicants because when you're a drug addict, especially on opiates, if you try to get high or get, get intoxicated on let's say beer, alcohol, or, or pot, or marijuana, um, you will find your way back to your drug of choice, which in this case was the most powerful of them, Oxycontin, the opiate. So he told him, he says, I can't, you know, I can't drink, I can't, I can't do any intoxicants. I'm going to, I've been in rehab, I'm going to be the best teammate that you have, and we're going to have a great year. And they did. They did. Kevin played great. Kevin was one of the top. Well, he was he was as good as anybody on that team, really. He made uh, he made all New England and all uh, conference East Coast conference. 
He uh, was the second highest scorer on the team. And uh, he had a great season. And, and I had a great I had a great time watching him. You know, I was the lacrosse coach at Lindbrook. I was the head coach at Lindbrook. Kevin, Kevin played with, you know, for me. And um, now he's playing in the big time. And I'm watching him. I go down to uh, North Carolina to watch him. I go up to Yale. I go out to Ohio State. It was the best of times for, for parents. My wife and I went out there. And uh, Kevin's mom, because I had split up with Kevin's mom, Kevin's mom went out there. We watched him play. He was one of the great. It was one of the great times of our life. And after, after uh, games, I would take him out to dinner, and we talk about how well he's doing, and he how proud we are of him, and everything was going great until the last game of the year. Now, the last game of the year I remember was against Rutgers, and after that last game, they had a party for all the seniors and their parents. And because all the seniors were over 21, they had a they had a keg at the party. A keg of beer. And I see Kevin going up to the keg at the party with a uh, big red cup. And he's pouring himself a beer. I say, hey, Kevin, hey, what do you think you're doing? He says, Don't, stop right there, Dad. Stop. I'm having a beer. And I'm 21 years old. And don't think I'm never going to have a beer again. I'm with my buddies. The season's over. We're celebrating. I'm going to have a beer. I said, Kevin, you know that they say if you have a beer, you're going to. Because I don't care what they say. I'm going to have a beer. I'm going to have a couple of beers. And I'm not going to go back to Oxycontin. I'm not going to go back to the opiates. Just get off my get off my case here. And I didn't handle that too well. I slapped the beer out of his hand. And uh, that brought us real close to physical contact. And my wife gets in between the two of us because it would have been a nightmare. There was all these parents and all these kids, and they won a big game, and the season was over. And, and here the father and son are going to wrestle on the ground here in a second, you know? So my wife pulled me away and said, we're getting out of here. And she pulled me away and I got back in my car and we drove, uh, we drove home to Long Island. I live in Long Beach. We drove home. Um, it takes about three hours. Seemed like the longest three hours of my life. And I remember saying to myself, I just hope the, uh, the counselors at the drug rehab are wrong. I hope they're wrong. Because what they said was, if Kevin starts drinking, he's going to be back to his drug of choice in no time. And I just hope they were wrong. But they're not. The people in drug rehabs work with, work with this problem all the time. They know how it works. And the thing was, Kevin was not only back on opiates within within a month or two months, he was a heroin addict. Now, what's the difference between heroin and Oxycontin? Not a lot. They're both opiates. They're both powerful opiates. Oxycontin, when he used Oxycontin, he, um, he would chop it up. It's a pill. He'd chop it up and snort it up his nose. But heroin, you, um, heroin, you, you take, it's a street drug. It's not, you know, Oxycontin you get from a pharmacist. Heroin you get from a, from a, a drug dealer. And Kevin was now shooting this in his arm. When I found that out, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how, how a relapse hurts the family to find out after all Kevin had gone through, through rehab and the whole deal, that he had relapsed. And now he's mainlining heroin in his arm. So now what do we do? What do we do now that we have a heroin addict for a son? Um, 
There's two theories to that. And I went to the uh, drug rehabs and, and asked them, you know, what do I do? And they said, oh, Mr. Glenn, you've got to fix it. Nothing good can happen to Kevin. Nothing good can happen to Kevin while he's a drug addict. He's going to have to get clean. So I said, what do I do? He said, well, you, you're going to have to use all your, all your leverage to get him back into rehab because he's not going to go in on his own. And my leverage included the fact that I paid his tuition at school. I owned his car. I paid for his phone. All important things to him. And that if he doesn't go back into rehab now, because he still had another semester left uh, to, to graduate. If he doesn't go back, I'm not going to send him back to school to graduate. I'm taking his car away, which I did. I'm taking his phone away, which I did, until he goes back into rehab. That's one theory of how you help him. There's another theory. And that theory I got from the 12-step program of, uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous, of AA, and uh, the group, the 12-step program for the parents and families and friends of addicts is called Al-Anon. And Al-Anon teaches you that me, the father, I didn't cause this, but I can't cure it and I can't control it either. That the drug addict is in charge. I can't cure his disease. Now, that's two different theories. One saying I've got to get him back in rehab or nothing good can happen. The other one saying you don't have the power. You can love him and you can help him and encourage him to get back into rehab, but it's not up to you. It's up to him. Oh boy, so which do I do? I tried to do both actually, you know? I took away all those things and eventually, and he couldn't go back to school. And with the help of some other family members, we were able to finally talk Kevin into going back to rehab. And he did. He went to another 30 day program, and these aren't cheap, these programs. And they're not free, you know? And there's no guarantee that they're going to work. But when you're the father uh, or parent of a, of a drug addict, you'll do anything. You'll do anything to cure your son. Because they say nothing good can happen. There's only three things that can happen, they say. And one is that he will go to jail. Another is that he'll go insane from this. And most common He'll die from an overdose. Heroin addicts don't last a long time. Oh, boy. So I've got to work at this fast. If I'm going to help save Kevin's life, I've got to work at this fast. So with some help, we've finally taken all these things away and I guess making his life as miserable as you can. We got him to go back into a rehab. And after 30 days, he came out and he relapsed again within a month meaning he, he knows where to get the heroin and he goes get it because there is a craving. Drug addicts that are on opiates, like heroin, like Oxycontin, they have a tremendous craving. It's not like, it's not like you could do heroin a couple of times a week or you could do it on, you know, on Monday, but, you know, I'll do it next time. I'll do it on the weekend. It doesn't work that way. If you, in the first day, when you, once you're addicted to heroin, if you don't get it for one day, you can't think of anything else. Kevin couldn't think. He was like crawling in his skin there. All he did was, was, was think about getting it. You know, uh, how can I get it? He, he couldn't focus on anything else. He was itching uh, to get it. He was nervous. He was a mess in the first day. On the second day, if you're a heroin addict, you are physically ill. You, you are dope sick is what they call it. 
You know, you you um you have pains in your stomach. You throw up everything that you've got. You have you have pains in your in your joints, in your elbows, and in your knees, and in your back. And you curl up on the third day. You're such a mess. You curl up into a fetal position and and just lie there. And all you can think about is getting it, getting the drug. That's the only thing that you think about when you can't get it. So you have to detox from this drug. And when you go to rehab, they will detox you in those first three days, four days that you will be in, you know, I've never experienced it personally, but from what Kevin says, it's the worst thing that you could possibly think of detoxing from these drugs. But he did, he detox and then it come out of rehab and somewhere down the line, never longer than three months, he would he would go back to it. The craving, he says, Dad, when he was clean during his periods of recovery, he says, Dad, I, you know, I I dream, I dream that I'm I, I'm shooting up heroin. I dream that it's there and that I do it. And then I wake up in the morning. And I realized that I didn't do it, but I I want it. I want it. I'm craving it. I think about how to get it. And then, you know, I try to get through the day and not do it, but I'm thinking about it. And then I go to bed at night and I dream about it again. It haunts me, he says. It's always there. This is while he's clean. He's telling me this. Because when he's using, he's always lying. Lying and, and, and drug addiction go hand in hand. Uh, no drug addicts tell you the truth. It just kind of goes with it. And so Kevin relapsed, I think, six times. He was in inpatient, inpatient rehabs. He was in outpatient rehabs. He had addiction psychologists. He had um, all sorts of help. We were on top of this. It wasn't like we weren't paying attention. It was my focus at all times. And this went on, this drug addiction, get him into rehab, periods of recovery, usually around three months. And then relapse. And every relapse felt like death to me, to his family, to those who loved him. And then we had to start all over. And he resists going in. And he likes the outpatient rehabs because he can kind of make believe that he's trying to get clean, but really he's focused on getting the drug. I went to AA meetings with him uh, or NA meetings, Narcotics Anonymous with him. Um, And he's making believe that he's clean, but he's using. But he's just trying to, he's going to these meetings in order to keep me off his back. But it shows up. Once you're using, you get in trouble. You're a mess. And you have to steal to get the money to pay for this. If his habit started off doing um, one pill a day or or one certain amount of heroin, it's a drug that you have to do more all the time. It increases. You can't continue to get high at that level. You have to do more of it every day. So you have to do like three times as much in order to get high. And it costs more money. Where's Kevin going to get that money? Where do drug addicts get the money? They steal. So Kevin, we had caught Kevin certainly stealing from me. And he stole most of the money from his mother. Because stealing from your parents is not a good thing, but at least it's safe. Parents are unlikely. And Kevin's mother would insist that we don't go to the cops on this. You know? Um, so where's he getting the money? He's stealing it, but you can only steal so much from your parents because they're going to be tipped off on this. So it got to the point where Kevin was so 
so addicted that he needed a lot of money. And what he did was he had two other heroin addict friends. And they actually, uh, now I found this out from Kevin. The story I'm going to tell you here, I found out from Kevin during his last period of recovery. His last period of recovery was nine months. And he looked like he was doing good. I'll get to that in a second. But he was, he was, um, he was in a, a, a gang of three. And what they were going to do was they were going to steal money from people who took the money out of ATMs. So when people go to an ATM, they get the cash. This is when they're going to steal. So Kevin told me this story. When he was clean, he told me the story that he, um, he and his two buddies there, uh, one was the getaway driver. One was the lookout to find somebody that looked like they'd be easy to get the money from once they got the money from the ATM. And one was the mugger, the person who, who would steal the money from the person who just got out of it. And that person would wear a mask over his head. And he had a, a taser, a stun gun. And what he would do would, would be go, as, as the person gets the money, the lookout's looking for the person who gets the money. He gives the okay to the mugger. And as the mugger comes out, or even if he's in the bank with a mask on, he hits him under the chin with a stun gun, drops him to the floor, and takes the money and runs, leaving the person on the floor there to wake up not knowing what happened to him. So I said to Kevin, which one were you? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's a, there's a getaway driver, there's a lookout, and there's the, there's the mugger. Which one were you? And he said, well, I, I, was, I was the mugger. Why were you the mugger? He says, well, you know, I was easily the strongest and fastest. These other two guys were... were you know, they were fat guys. They weren't going to be able to run away. Um, and it had, to, it had to be me. I said, well, now remember, he's straight and clean and doing well when he tells me the story. I said, well, how did you feel about that when you did that? He said, look, Dad, right now, I feel awful about it. I feel awful telling you this. But you said everything is forgivable, so I'm telling you. This is how bad it got. Um, but at the time, I was jonesing, dope sick, so bad that I was so excited that I had the money. We went right away to the drug dealer, gave him the money, got the heroin, shot up, and then we were okay again. Until we needed to do it again, which is a couple of days later, depending on how much money we got out of this. And we know that at some point we're going to get caught, you know. But you have, you know, we were, we, were, we were so dope sick that we had to do it. Because no excuse, Dad. I'm just telling you the way it was. So on Kevin's, when, when I retired from teaching, Kevin was at his worst. He was as strung out as you could possibly get. And we we didn't know how, you know, we had tried these rehabs so much, we were in and out of rehab so much. It just it, it just didn't seem like anything was going to work. And then it just so happened that his cousin, who was 40 years old, his cousin um, came out of Iowa. They had a big flood on the Mississippi his cousin Rob lived on the Mississippi, and he came back to New York, his old home, uh, because his, his house had been flooded, and they had to wait for the waters to go down. And when he got to our house, he found out that his favorite cousin, Kevin, was a, a heroin addict. And he says, how come I didn't know about this? He said, well, you know something, uh, Rob? When you got a heroin addict in the family, you don't go around telling everybody. There's a stigma. You're ashamed. 
There's a stigma to being an addict, and, and there's a stigma to the parents. They're ashamed to go around telling people, you know, that my son's a heroin addict, especially the kid who was had everything going for him, the star of Lindbrook High School here, the, the scholarship boy, the prom king, the greatest kid. How does he become a heroin addict? You can't tell that. You can't explain that to people. So he says, well, look, why don't, why don't, you know, maybe it's New York. Maybe he just can't complain in New York. Why don't I take him back to Iowa when we go back? I'm going back in a few days. Why don't we take him back to Iowa? They got rehabs there. He could go to, he could go there to rehab. And then when he comes out, don't go back to New York. He could live with me. I'll get him a job and uh, he could stay clean. He's got maybe a better chance there. I said, well, Rob, that's that's very generous of you to say that, but Kevin won't go. I can't get Kevin to go to rehab. He's not going to go to Iowa to go to a rehab. And um, Rob said, well, we, we can ask him, right? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can ask him. So we brought Kevin in and said, and Rob said, that hey, Kevin, um, listen, we know you, you, you're addicted to, to heroin. Do you want to? Come with me back to Iowa. We'll, we'll get you into a good rehab. You can come and you can live with me. And 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 Marla, who's his wife, Marla's a sweetheart. Uh, you can live with us and we'll get you a job and and um, and see if that works. Would you be willing to do that? And I'm thinking, Kevin's never going to do that. But instead, Kevin says, yeah. Yeah, I'll go. I was amazed. We had, him, we had him on a plane the next day, out to, or maybe it was two days, uh, going out to Iowa. I was amazed he said yes. He wouldn't say yes to anything. I found out later, because when Kevin went to Iowa, he went into rehab in Iowa, and he was, I don't know, somehow Kevin was the star of the rehab, because I went out to Iowa and visited him in there. Everybody loved Kevin. He was the only New Yorker in, in Iowa, it seemed like, in the rehab anyway, and he had that New York accent, and he was a uh, he was a funny kid. Everybody loved Kevin anyway. You know, everybody loved Kevin in Limerick High School, and everybody loved Kevin at UMass, and everybody loves Kevin. He's that kind of personality. And so everybody loved him in the rehab, too, in Iowa. And they said he's doing great, and he's got a great attitude, and everything's changed. And when he got out, I was there. When he got out, um, and all the people in the rehab hugged him and told him good luck, and everything was great, and he we went back to Rob's house where he was, Kevin was going to live, and and uh, everything looked great. We were so happy because at one point it looked like this was never going to happen. And Rob did get him a job as a waiter, and he was a lousy waiter. <laughs> he, he didn't get fired, though. And then he, you know, because he had graduated from UMass, he, he graduated as a social worker. And so he could get a job as a social worker in in Iowa, in Davenport, Iowa. He actually became an addiction counselor, if you can believe that, an addiction counselor, but not for drugs. He became a gambling addiction counselor. Now, he, he didn't have that addiction. He had a drug addiction, but he didn't have a gambling addiction. And he was telling me about it. He said, gambling addictions are... They're even worse because because uh, people who can't stop gambling are losing people's money, and then they owe then they owe bad people money, and those people are well they could kill them, but they want the money back. So gambling if you're a gambling addict, you're going to get your family killed. They'll kill your family before they kill you because they want the money. I'm oh, I'm listening to this, and I go, well, Dad, don't worry. I mean, I don't have a gambling addiction. I'm 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 the counselor, and they loved them there. They said Kevin. Kevin gets along with all these addicts. He says they, 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 they feel a genuine, a genuine helper in Kevin. He said he's he's doing a great job. I talked to the boss of the, of the, uh, of the gambling addiction rehab there in Iowa, and they said Kevin's the one of the best we've got. And I'm not surprised. Kevin's good at stuff, and he's and people love him. So he understood this kind of thing. And he also got a, a girlfriend there. And you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to get, you're not supposed to have a girlfriend when you're in recovery. 
that's one of the things because, well, I guess they figure that, you know, if you break up, it's going to be emotional thing and the person will, will, will relapse. But Kevin said to me, Hey, look, don't dad, don't even, don't even go there. He goes, I'm, I'm in, I'm living in Iowa instead of New York. I, I am, I, I don't drink. I, I don't smoke pot. I don't do any drugs. Uh, I'm working two jobs and uh, I'm going to have a girlfriend. And Kevin never had any trouble getting a girlfriend. That was pretty easy for him. He was a good-looking kid with a lot of personality. And he had a beautiful girlfriend. And, um, well, this is what – when Kevin when – Kevin, uh, we went out there, my son Matt and I, we went out there. This is what Kevin looked like, you know, as uh, as he was clean. Matt, Matt is uh, – the guy in the white sweater and Kevin's got the red on there and he's looking pretty clean at this point. You know, he looked great. We were so pleased. We were so happy. He was working. He had a job. Everybody thought he was doing good. And I, you know, I say to myself, I knew we could do this. You know, I, I knew we could do it. And I really didn't know, but I was saying that I did, you know, and, and so Kevin's got the girlfriend and, uh, well, Hold on a second. Um, he got that girlfriend pregnant. And that's my granddaughter, Olivia, with Melanie, his girlfriend. That's Kevin kissing Melanie, uh, Olivia's head. So Kevin got his girlfriend pregnant, and they had a baby. And now I wouldn't. I wouldn't want that for a guy who's who's right out of rehab wouldn't want that kind of pressure on him but that's you know I didn't know I mean and Kevin said to me hey dad you know how you know how you used to say that some things that seem terrible during the time that they're happening turn out to be the best thing that could ever happen to you you know it's something like that maybe maybe having a baby is just what I need and then, and then he relapsed again. I can't tell you. When I found out he relapsed, I, I got on a plane right away and went out to Iowa. And uh, I had great difficulty in trying to get him to um, get back into rehab. But we, he did go back into rehab, but not for long. He left. He was in bad shape. And he had a girlfriend and he had a baby. And he was a heroin addict again. This was a, a bad time. This was a bad time. And, um, well, he, he got clean for a little while after the baby was born. But he still had the cravings, and he told me that all the time, that I can't stop thinking about him. And uh, because he had, people had known him as a drug addict, he, oh, no. No, tell me this isn't true. Come on. You can continue. I can. Can you see me? I see you. Yeah, you're good. Okay, you're I, don't, I don't see me anymore. Okay, thank you. Uh, I got to turn this phone off somehow here. Yeah. No, no, leave it on because we have questions coming to you. Well, the problem is that the – okay, okay, good. Okay, very good. Yeah, All you're right. perfect. You're still inside the Zoom. You're, you're doing well. All thank right, you. great. All right. <laughs> All right, I can't see myself now. I'm looking at a blank screen. That's fine. All right, so um, Kevin, Kevin now is uh, – is at the point where he is has the cravings, he has the girlfriend, he has the baby, Olivia. 
and we need to get him back into rehab again. And so um, I get a call from, from Rob one day, and he says that he – That he rela that he actually they found uh, they found Kevin was in a hospital, and that he had overdosed. He had he was driving a car. He actually pulled over to shoot up, I guess, and he overdosed. And they found him and they took him to a hospital. And that he was home now. Rob said he was home now, but he's in bad shape. You know, he's a he's a real mess from the overdose. And I gave him a call, and and uh, and he answered the phone. And I remember saying to him, hey, Kev, I, I heard that you overdosed. He goes, yeah, Dad, I, I tell you, I, I didn't expect to. I didn't expect to, to, to relapse there. But, you know, this guy came over and said if I gave him a ride across the river that he wanted to pick up some more heroin, uh, that he'd give me some for free. And I know I should have said no, but... Um, but I didn't. And uh, I had heard that there was some bad heroin going around um, that area. And uh, I overdosed on it, he said. And uh, now I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, Melanie and, and Olivia is, is at Rob's house and I'm here alone and uh, I'm not sure. Look, I'll call you back, Dad. Uh, and I said, well, Kevin, hold on a second. Everything's going to be all right. You know, relapse is part of recovery, and um, you're going to be all right. And he said, yeah, Dad, I know, I know. Uh, but I got to call I got to call Melanie, and, you know, I, I got to – I'll, I'll get back to you. And I said, okay, Kevin, all right, just know you're going to be okay. I love you, Kevin. He goes, I love you too, Dad. And that was the last I spoke to Kevin because while he was home alone, he still had that same batch of heroin that he overdosed on. And this was bad heroin. And, and he died on it the next day. Now, um, that was on Valentine's Day. I got the call. I'm out for Valentine's dinner with my wife. I got the call that Kevin had passed. I can't. I can't, I can't tell you what that's like. The funeral for Kevin. And the funeral was a week later because it was a crime scene. He had he had died from an illegal overdose, and he was in Iowa. We had to get him back to uh, back to Long Island for the funeral, and and. Um, those were those were, were terrible times, really. And um, so, listen, I'm gonna I'm just gonna tell you what I learned from this, okay? Um, I'm gonna hold this up. I can't see anything right now, but I'm gonna hold this up. One of the things I learned from this is that only the love matters. Now, what does that mean? For most of the time. I was so scared, I was coming from fear. And when you come from fear at any time, you don't get the best out of yourself. So I was so afraid that Kevin was going to die or go to jail or, or kill somebody while he's on driving a car or something like that. I was so scared that I really, I really, couldn't, I really couldn't help him that well. And I was, uh, I was going to my higher power. I was praying and asking for help. And, I, and the message I would get was just love Kevin anyway. You have no idea what Kevin needs to go through. You just love him anyway. That's hard to do with a heroin addict. But I definitely tried. I definitely tried. And um, the... Uh, the next thing I learned, the other thing, other things I learned is, and I hold this out, usually I have a PowerPoint and I use uh, that. This says forgiveness is the key to happiness. Well, 
Forgiveness is something I had to learn. I had to forgive myself for not being able to save my son's life. I had seven years of that addiction to save his life. I, I had to learn to forgive Kevin. And I wrote the book, Forgiving Kevin. In order to cure myself, I had to write a book because nobody could understand how a wonderful kid like Kevin, the, the, the star of Lindbergh High School, how, how could he die as a heroin addict? How could that be? And so I, I started writing this book. I kind of helped, helped to heal myself by writing this book. And I knew it was going to help others. And because I wrote this book, I, get to, I got to speak a lot over this period of time. I got to speak like I'm speaking to you, except for it wasn't virtual. And so I had to learn to forgive myself, for, to forgive Kevin, to forgive everybody that was involved in this. Because people who can't forgive can't heal. I've met a lot of people who have lost their kid this way now since I've lost mine. And they can't get they can't get out of bed. They can't, they don't have a happy day. Me, I've got a lot to live for. I got a lot of love in my life. But how how am I different than the others? Well, I say here great strength comes from a connection to your higher power. I've got a strong connection to God. I meditate, I have a daily spiritual practice. I'm connected to my higher power all the time, or at least I try to be. I do the best I can. And so with God's help, I've been able to heal. When a lot of other people that suffered the same fate as, 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 as I did at losing a son to heroin, um, they haven't been able to recover. Now, so love, forgiveness, and a connection to your higher power seems to be what I learned from this. And I know I, I have, I have uh, told a very frightening story, and the reason is because, you know, story sometimes hits home better than statistics did about how you can go wrong with drug addiction. But I'm going to try to lighten up here and let you know why I have a lot to live for. Kevin's daughter, now these are my three granddaughters. I can't see anything, so I'm just going to hope that you can see this. But um, these are my three granddaughters. And Olivia, this is Olivia, the biggest one, all right? And she's 10 now. And Julia and Lila are the other three. Olivia comes every summer to New York from Iowa. And I send her to camp here in Long Beach, and the three of them are best of friends. And we and they're the they're the, the light of my life, these three girls. And Olivia is doing great. She's doing well in school. She's a beautiful girl. She's got she's got a uh, Kevin's family is is in contact with her all the time. And so she's doing well. This is another picture. This is, uh, okay, this is, I I'm not sure how this is coming out. But this is uh, my wife and me and the three girls. This is the best part of my life right now. And there's a lot to live for in this. And, and, and this last picture here. It's one of my favorite pictures. This is my son, Matt. I hope you can see this. This is my son, Matt, with the three girls in uh, Kevin's mom's pool in Merrick. And why this is one of my favorite pictures, it's also very sad because Kevin's missing from that picture. And so, hey, look. I'm doing well. I got a lot of love in my life. I have Kevin as, a, as an angel right now. I feel Kevin's arm around me as I speak to you right now. It's been Kevin's inspiration that allows me to speak to all these college, high school, and middle school kids 
And um, and we're hoping that Kevin's death maybe helps somebody like you that doesn't try things that will hurt him so badly. Maybe this is the best lesson we can give. And right now, I think I'm, I'm done with my presentation. Um, might need some questions, though. You know? Yeah, we have about eight questions. Okay, good. <clears throat> you can see First question on, is, man. did Kevin do drugs in high school? Ah, it's a great question. Now, I found out, remember, Kevin was doing great in high school, but I found out that, that's a great question. Kevin actually was smoking pot his senior year. He started smoking pot with his friends during lunchtime, because in Lindbrook, you can, you can leave the school and go, go home. And he and his friends would smoke pot every day at lunch. And I'd say, every day? You were smoking pot every day? And he said, yeah, yeah, we were smoking pot every day, you know? And, and now the, the thing I find significant about that, if you're smoking pot every day, and pot certainly is not like Oxycontin. It's a much different drug. But if you're, if you're a young person and you're doing a, a drug like, like, like uh, cannabis, like pot, like Oxycontin, uh, no, like uh, marijuana, you're in a category that is likely to become a drug addict. If you're, if you're, he's actually addicted to pot as a 17-year-old, well, then that's somebody that when, what happened with Kevin was they just said, hey, look, you, you, you know, you got to try this. Now, if you're, if you're willing to do an illegal drug, uh, you might be willing to do a different illegal drug. And that's what happened to Kevin. You know, he thought if he thought pot smoking was okay, then he thought uh, he could think he tried cocaine and he didn't like cocaine that much. But then when he tried Oxycontin, he thought that was the greatest. So, yes, Kevin was not only using uh, marijuana his senior year, he was using it every day. And he told me that when he was a gambling addiction counselor in Iowa. So that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Uh, how did Kevin's drug addiction affect his brother's life? His brother's five years older than him. And although I know his brother had, uh, his brother would drink socially and, and he, he might even even smoke pot uh, or, or might have at one point, um, he didn't have a drug problem. And the thing that affects him is his, is his brother's death. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is his only brother. So um, we're all trying to heal from this. It's, a, it's had a, a negative effect on us all and on his brother. But his brother was lucky that he, uh, he got married the year right after Kevin died and had a baby of his own. That's uh, Julia. I showed you a picture of her, Julia. Um, so... The family, thank God for Julia, because the family became focused on a new life in our family instead of the death that we had just experienced. Thanks. Did Kevin lose friends because he was doing heroin? Yes. Yes. Most of Kevin's friends, well, none of Kevin's friends did heroin. None of Kevin's friends did Oxycontin. But Kevin's friends were drinkers and maybe pot smokers. And maybe they do cocaine. They weren't angels, you know. But uh, the one they did they did keep their distance from Kevin towards the end. There, yes, he did lose friends. Okay, even though Kevin did drugs and did other illegal robberies, deep down, was he a kind person? And was it the drugs that were making him do it? That's a great question. He was a kind person. Kevin was the nicest kid. Everybody loved Kevin. Um, did he change with the drugs? Yes, when he was dope sick, when he couldn't get the drug. Nobody could imagine Kevin using a stun gun on a stranger to steal his money. 
So yeah, it changed him when he was dope sick. When he got high, he was back to being his lovable self. And when he was when he was clean during those periods of recovery, and there were many periods of recovery in the seven years, then he was his old self. Yeah. Okay. Um, how did you get it out of your other son that Kevin was addicted to the drugs? Oh, I enlisted him. We got to help him. We got to save his life. Matt, Matt joined right in on this. Matt knew that Kevin was in trouble and both of us wanted to save his life. So we had to, you know, I asked his friends, you know, your friends don't want to give their buddy up to the parent, you know, but to talking to Matt, they would. So without Matt, I would have never really found out anything. Matt was a great help. So we'll put, the, we'll put two questions together. It's about mental health and depression. So was Kevin depressed when he started using drugs, do you think? Kevin wasn't depressed. What he was was kind of an anxious kid. Kevin was a, a nervous kid, uh, you know, nervous about, you know, nervous about a lot of things. He was always like that. He was nervous if he if he um, if he had a test, even though he'd be prepared. He was nervous. He was nervous before big games, uh, wrestling matches, football games, lacrosse games. Um, he was he was anxious, and he said that uh, when he was talking about pot, he said that you know. He needed, he needed to self-medicate. He needed to calm down. And nothing, he said, calmed him down better than opiates. And so that's how, you know, that, that aspect of his personality, not depression, but anxiety, that aspect of him helped lead him to, to become a drug addict. Okay, then this is, this is the final question we have. Why did he get drugs from the doctors in the first place? He didn't get drugs from a doctor. He never got hurt or had that. He got drugs from other kids who now, let's say he's a pot smoker and they're smoking pot together and they say to him, hey, look, you got to try this. And they chop up that pill, that Oxycontin pill, and they snort it through a straw. They say, I want you to try this. Now, if you're willing to do an illegal drug to begin with, you might be willing to do a more dangerous one. Kevin didn't realize the danger or the or the addiction or the cravings or the or the miserable life that would follow him snorting that oxycotton pill. But from the time he snorted that pill, he was in trouble for the rest of his short life. Which leads you to say, don't get started with this. This is a this is a call to action for all of you young guys and, and girls. Don't get started with this. It's a story. It's not a statistic, but it's a true story. And it's designed to try to help you to not get started. Do you have any closing remarks other than those? I think we're going to be wrapping, I think, because there are no more questions from the students. Okay, well, I want to thank you all. Listen, I've talked to you. I've talked to kids at Great Neck North for a few years now. You're a wonderful bunch. I wish I could see you. Right now, I'm just looking at a, a, a dead screen here. But uh, I want to thank you. And um, 